Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Thank you, John. Stand away from the podium a little bit. Well, the first thing I want to say is how delighted I am to see all of you here. <laughs> you know, it's been over a year. It's been crazy. It's been so tough. And I'm sure it's been just as tough for you as it is for me. It's probably your first time seeing this many people together <laughs> after all this time. So, you know, given some rounds of applause to the people who organized this, I just want to give a round of applause of celebration for everyone here, for being here, for together, finally. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Now, getting to the good stuff. How do you become agile and innovative in an evolving nuclear landscape for a strong nuclear future? That's the goal. And I'm going to bring it back to the sad theme that Steve raised, is unfortunately, right now, the nuclear landscape is looking a little dim and dark. Unfortunately, there are many nuclear plants closing right now, like the Indian Point and Energy Nuclear Plant in New York. That's pretty sad. It was recognized as one of the best nuclear plants in the United States and was nearly nearing completion of its 20-year license extension. But it was closed. Why was it closed? Well, because of environmentalist opposition, anti-business environmentalists. What they did was that they, they mobilized the existing negative public opinion on nuclear. They used that negative public opinion to push politicians to close Indian Point nuclear plant. So that's a big issue. A related issue is, of course, unfair market conditions that a number of nuclear plants are facing, where the government is willing to support clean energy of all sorts, solar, wind, hydro, but not nuclear. That's a big problem, discriminatory, I, discrimination against nuclear. And nuclear top executives tell me that a serious growing problem is pressure from ESG investors. This is definitely a major issue. I mean, consider what happened with Exxon recently, where these ESG investors were able to force their preferred candidates on the board of Exxon against the opposition of the Exxon leadership. These are all issues facing nuclear. So, does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> nuclear plants are closing over the all over the country. You have the Dwayton Arnold nuclear plant, you have Exelon's Byron and Dresden plants. This is sad, this is tragic. This is happening in the United States, the home of nuclear power. But right now, we only are getting 20% of our energy from nuclear. And you know what, it's been declining. It's been declining for a while now, and the US Energy Information Agency from where this chart is from is showing that it's projected to decline if we continue the current trends, if you continue on the way that you're going right now. You don't wanna do that. So, the main issue that you're facing, that you need to realize, it's hard to realize it sometimes, it's not a visible issue, is this misleading narrative by anti-business environmentalist groups who are mobilizing public opinion to show nuclear in a negative light. That's what you're facing. That's the serious issue that you're facing. And the other issue related to it is there is a serious failure by nuclear to address this narrative in an effective manner. So you have this combination of issues which are the root cause of the tangible problems that you are seeing in nuclear that you are seeing every day. These are the symptoms of the underlying disease. And the symptoms are things like license plant extensions, things like plant profitability going down, things like construction being blocked, things like ESG investor pressure, unfair market conditions, and even disruptive competition from startups. You know what? This is not something that can continue if you want a strong future for nuclear. It doesn't have to be like this, and it can be like this for our kids, for our grandkids, 
for a strong America and for a strong nuclear. And what can you do about this? Well, that's what this presentation is about. We'll talk about some of the threats, some of the challenges, and then some of the solutions. That's what my remarks will be about. Now, we'll start our journey in a bit of a roundabout way to get an international comparative context so that we see ourselves in the reflection of other countries. And we'll go to a little bit of an unusual country, maybe, for comparison to the United States, France. If you think about it, it is quite similar. It's very developed, it's very diverse, it's very complex in many ways. Now, one way it's different, as you can probably guess, is environmentalists are much stronger in France than they are in the United States. So that's a difference. Indeed, in 2003, there was a poll done in France asking about the top goals of nuclear power, of energy in general, what should it be of all energy. And over two thirds said environmentalist concerns should be the top goal of energy electricity generation. So that shows you <laughs> what people think. So consider a recent incident around the closing of a nuclear plant in France and some protests around it. So I want you to imagine what these protests were like. Close your eyes, please close your eyes. Just imagine. Imagine what might be happening in that context. What signs are people holding? Close your eyes. <laughs> what are they chanting? Just take a couple of seconds to imagine that. Now you're probably imagining people standing in front of a nuclear plant and chanting no nuclear in the French version of it. I don't know French. <laughs> That's probably what you're imagining. Let's see what actually happened. Well, as you can see, the protest is not in front of the nuclear plant, it's in front of an office building. And the office building is specifically the office of the French branch of Greenpeace, the International Environmentalist Organization. So what happened was that Greenpeace pressured the French government to close a nuclear plant. And then it found its office the target of protesters, specifically pro-nuclear environmentalists. You heard me right, pro-nuclear environmentalists. <laughs> they do exist. They're holding signs saying less nuclear means more coal, nuclear power for the climate. And they got pretty good press coverage in the French press. And you know what? Their opinions align quite well with French public opinion. So there was a poll taken in 2011, right after the Fukushima disaster, asking about nuclear safety. And a large proportion of the French population over 60% saw nuclear as safe. They trusted the nuclear industry to keep them safe. They saw nuclear as safe. Now there was another poll done in 2019 in the United States. So far past Fukushima, no recent disasters. What did it find? Only 47% see nuclear as safe. So in France, you have more than enough people seeing nuclear as safe for a French politician who supports nuclear to get elected. And in the United States, you have more than enough for a nuclear supporting politician to lose. So what's happening in France? Why is this happening? What's going on? Why is the nuclear industry winning in France? It's winning so well that over two thirds of French power comes from nuclear, over two thirds. What go, what's going on? Do they have better technology than we do? No, they got all of their technology from the United States in the 1970s, literally. That's all their plans, you can check it out. The answer is not technical, it's psychological. That's where they have the advantage. They're using practices that research and behavioral science has shown are highly effective for controlling the narrative. What are they doing? They're running advertising campaigns that are tying nuclear to modern life that's comfortable and pleasant. They're going on tours to nuclear plants. Can you imagine? Nuclear plants are full of French people taking tours. And those tours are helping people see nuclear as comfortable, as everyday, as casual, as safe, as trustworthy. All nuclear workers, engineers, managers, are active advocates. 
They're conveying to their citizens every day, fellow citizens, as part of their work, the importance of safety and trustworthiness of nuclear. So that's another dynamic that's going on. As a result, nuclear is in charge of the narrative in France. It controls the narrative, and this is why it gets all of these benefits. And you know what? It's your job, every one of you here and everyone back in your companies, <laughs> to take control of the narrative in the United States, because ain't no one going to do it for you. It's your job. Now, unfortunately, we as human beings suffer from some dangerous judgment errors that are described in this book. These dangerous judgment errors, you might have heard of them, are called cognitive biases. And one of these mental blind spots is called functional fixedness. You might have heard of the term, of the idea that when you have a hammer, everything that looks like a nail, right? Famous phrase. And that's what functional fixedness is about. When we have a certain tool set, a certain way of approaching issues, all of our perspectives are to use this tool set for this, all issues that we're facing, even when other tool sets are available and it would be much more effective to apply to these challenges. So you folks, everyone here this morning, overwhelmingly have a scientific background, engineering background, and that's the tool set that you're using. And that's natural, that's just how our minds work. It's not something that's a problem for you except that it's impeding your goals in this situation because tools from behavioral science are much, much more effective for addressing the low, low hanging fruit of taking control of the narrative. But folks who have a technical mindset tend to not realize that. You know, it's often much harder to actually address a people problem than a technical problem. That's why people say the soft stuff is the hard stuff. Now, I see some of you sitting there, kind of a skeptical expression, crossing your arms, <laughs> and now you're chuckling because it's you. <laughs> you might not believe that the narrative, that just this kind of narrative, what's going on in people's heads, has anything to do with your bottom line profits, or anything significant at least. Well, you might be falling into what's called the empathy gap, one of these cognitive biases, dangerous judgment errors, where we greatly underestimate the impact and influence of other people's emotions, other people's emotions on their behavior, on their thought patterns, and therefore on us. How are they influencing us? So that's the empathy gap. And I believe, from what I've talked about to a number of you here already, and a number of nuclear executives, that the nuclear industry is greatly underestimating the impact of negative public opinion on nuclear. I'll give you some evidence on that, hard evidence. There was a study done in MIT in 2018 looking at profitability of nuclear. It found that a very important issue, a key issue for the profitability of nuclear was the fact that people, the public, broad public, supported subsidies for all sorts of clean energy, for solar, wind, hydro, but not nuclear. And that's why nuclear isn't getting a lot of subsidies, the due subsidies that it deserves for its clean, emissions-free energy. So that's a big issue that has to do with the public narrative. And here's another one. Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon study, 2020, just out last year, was looking at regulations. And what it found was that the regulatory burden on nuclear is so large and so excessive for the comparative need for safety. When you look at what's actually necessary for safety, the regulatory burden is so huge that it makes nuclear more expensive than coal. When the baseline costs of nuclear should be quite a bit less than coal, and they would be without this regulatory burden. And that's because of fear, public fear. Public worry is about risk. That's what's driving this regulatory burden. Now, the regulatory burden on carbon emitting plants, coal plants, natural gas is much, much lower than a nuclear. And you know what? The closing of any nuclear plant leads to two million tons of carbon emissions per year. Any nuclear plant. Because it's 
replaced by fossil fuels. So that's, the, that's what the Carnegie Mellon study showed, same study. Now, what's going on there? Well, what's the impact of that replacement? Think about that. It's really bad for public health. It's much more dangerous for public health to have those two million tons of carbon. So there was a study done in the University of Washington in 2014, which found that emissions from fossil fuel electricity kill over 16,000 people per year in the United States. Fossil fuel emissions. That's how many people they kill. And guess what? Closing a nuclear plant, replacing it by fossil fuel plants. So for example, the Indian point was replaced by free fossil fuel plants. Results in many dozens of people killed per year. That's what happens for each nuclear plant that's closed. That's an outrage. I'm outraged, you should be outraged. It's ridiculous. It's literally deadly to close a nuclear plant. But who's talking about this? Why is nobody talking about this? So we're seeing these burdensome regulations on nuclear. We're killing people right now as we speak because the regulations of how are they framed. I'm not criticizing in any way the NRC, David, <laughs> just being very clear. It's not uh, your job to frame the regulations, kind of the underlying point is that it's about public fears. They're framed as bringing risk down to zero as much as possible from public opinion because people are scared. And that's a very ridiculous way to approach risk. Again, not criticizing the NRC because you have to measure risk against trade-offs. And what's the trade-off against nuclear? <laughs> it's fossil fuels. How many people are you killing by closing a nuclear plant? That should be the trade-off. That should be the risk trade-off. It shouldn't be zero. <laughs> That's nothing, no impact. The trade-off is nuclear or fossil fuels. How many people are going to be potentially damaged, killed by this? And if you do that sort of calculation, well, <laughs> nuclear comes out way ahead. And it's your job to shift public opinion. It's not David's job to shift public opinion. We're talking about you working to shift public opinion and that will eventually percolate to much better regulations for you. How do you shift public opinion? Well, you use behavioral science strategies like reframing. So imagine you go out to lunch and you have an option of two frozen yogurts. One says 20% fat and the other says 80% fat free. What would you prefer? But raise your hand if you would like 20% fat. Raise your hand if you would like 80% fat free. 20% fat means it's 80% fat free. 80% fat free means it's 20% fat. <laughs> but for some reason, 80% fat free sounds much more delicious and appealing. <laughs> so, reframing is a key strategy that you can use to seize control of public opinion. Framing effect. We are very much influenced by how issues are framed, as you can see from this example. So what, how can you reframe nuclear? You can reframe nuclear as everyday, casual, and safe, as they do in France. We have a clear example of a winning strategy. You want to show how nuclear prevents deaths from these fossil fuel plants. That's a very effective reframing. So think about this. A number of nuclear plants have closed recently, unfortunately. You can easily fund a couple of studies to look at the specific event effects of a closing of a nuclear plant on the local community after some fossil fuel plants are built, like the three fossil fuel plants that were built to replace the first uh, to Indian Point nuclear plant. And you know what? You'll find the number of deaths increased. And then you can bring this hard data to the public and to public officials and say, you know, if you don't support nuclear plants, if you're not supporting nuclear plants, you're killing your neighbors, your friends. Now that's a powerful framing, and that's how you should frame things. You want to organize plant tours. If France can do it safely, we can do it. <laughs> Other sorts of community outreach. And you want to do public advertising campaigns. Why do I see commercials every day on TV for wind, for solar, for coal? for natural gas, not nuclear. You know, I, I was curious, I googled pro-nuclear advertising, and the first result on Google was from 2013. <laughs> 
2013, that is not acceptable for a strong future for nuclear. Now, when you're looking at advocacy, again, going back to the French example, it's not simply reframing the message, it's also reframing the messenger. You wanna make sure that the burden of communication is not simply on the marketing and communication staff. So when I talk to nuclear communication marketing executives, they tell me that overwhelmingly they have to do the job of advocating for nuclear. And that just doesn't work. It needs to be a whole of industry effort. Everyone here in this room needs to do this. Why is this? Well, because you have much more credibility than marketing and communication staff. And the modern world looks for authenticity, and that authenticity comes from direct nuclear experience. So it's your job to get involved in it. You know, when I consult, when I consult with companies on how to train their staff on effective public advocacy, it's actually pretty doable. <laughs> You'll be surprised at how easily doable it is if you look, use the right behavioral strength strategies. They have to understand some of the problems. They have to overcome their introversion. That's a big issue. Folks tend to be more introverted in the technical workers, so they need to overcome their introversion and get approach, appropriate coaching, training, and support. But after they do that, very many excel at advocacy. And they need to be rewarded and promoted and evaluated based on this. So right now, forward-looking nuclear companies are already deploying their staff, their managers, their engineers, to do public advocacy. It's already going on. So you have people from Entergy and other companies doing things like media interviews, engineers, managers, doing things like writing letters to the editor, writing public blogs, doing talks for schools, for community groups, colleges, churches. And that's what needs to happen everywhere. You know, if France can do it, and we know it can, so can we. we lear France learned from us about nuclear technology, and we can learn from France about nuclear psychology. Another reframing is something that was already touched on about clear nuclear energy. You want to frame nuclear as the key to a clean energy future. It's the best, the most feasible, most reasonable financially path to that future. So you want to find the equivalent of the environmentalists in France, pro-nuclear environmentalists, and you want to support them, and you want to give them a bigger megaphone. And this is an issue that has support across the political divide. This is really important. The Conservative Climate Caucus was launched about two months ago by a third of all House Republicans who agreed that climate change is caused by people and it's a serious issue that we need to address. And its head, Rep Representative John Curtis, gave an interview about a month ago where he was asked, what kind of specific ideas do you have for policy change? And his one specific idea was that we can do nuclear at large scale and without a carbon footprint. <laughs> now, if a third of all, yes. So it's great. And if a third of all House Republicans can learn to speak the language of environmentalism, despite the current polarization, so can you. And for many of you, it won't be comfortable and easy. That's why people say the soft stuff is often the hard stuff. A key reframing that you need to pursue is avoiding discounting the future, avoiding short-term thinking, and orienting toward the long-term. That's what changing the narrative means, orienting toward that long-term goal, not the next quarter. Unfortunately, we have one of these cognitive biases, dangerous judgment errors, called hyperbolic discounting. We tend to greatly undercount the importance of the long-term future. And that's something you don't want to do. And that's something that, unfortunately, from a number of nuclear executives who I've talked to, happens too often in nuclear, this kind of focus on the short term, not nearly enough focus on the long term, a desire to take tempting shortcuts, like influencing public officials rather than trying to influence the public itself. So I'll give you an example, pretty egregious one, from my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. So go Bucks. <laughs> Yay, good job. <laughs> OH. Yes, there you go. Now, what happened in Columbus, Ohio? Well, a couple of years ago, in 2019, the state lawmakers passed legislation supporting nuclear with a, two nuclear plants with a subsidy of $1.3 billion. 
And that's great, I was excited to see that. Unfortunately, last year, some information came out about some shady payments that the company that owned the nuclear plants made to the lawmakers. And so that resulted in a federal indictment of the lawmakers, the nuclear executives, top nuclear executives of the company had to resign, the company paid a couple of hundred million dollars fine, and their subsidy was repealed. So now, not even the best nuclear company can get government support in Ohio, at least for the next couple of years while this is still on the radar. That's a terrible outcome for nuclear and everyone, like myself, who supports a bright future for nuclear. And that's something that you have to avoid. And of course, this is a super egregious example, but it is definitely indicative of a broader tendency in nuclear where there's way too much of a focus on influencing public officials in Washington and the state capitals and not nearly enough on shifting the narrative. Because seizing control of the narrative is really the key for you. That's what will determine your ability to succeed in the long term. Other issues are all going to be related to it. It's the root cause of the tangible problems that you're seeing. Things like regulation that we already talked about things like the unfair market conditions that we already talked about. And now we're gonna talk about another thing, the ESG investors that's very much related to seizing control of the narrative. So ESG stands for Environmental Social Governments Investors for folks who want to know about that. And when you look at what they talk, say about nuclear, when you look at what they write, when you look at panels, when you talk to them, what they say is overwhelmingly skepticism of nuclear because nuclear does not influence the public narrative nearly well enough and that there's too much negative public opinion against nuclear. That's what causes skepticism and pressure from ESG investors, just like the kind of pressure where Exxon was, had to accept those board members because of skepticism about Exxon's public narrative. And so these ESG investors are pretty skeptical about nuclear for that reason. They're also skeptical about nuclear for another reason which is so fixable. They're skeptical about nuclear because you've been advancing the environment all along, but you haven't been beating the environmental drum. What's up with that? <laughs> that, that makes it seem to ESG investors like you don't align with their values, and they're value-based investors. That's environment social governance. So of course they are skeptical about nuclear because you ain't beating the drum even though you've been supporting the environment all along. Now what they're not skeptical about and they're increasingly excited about is nuclear startups. Like TerraPower, backed by Bill Gates. Terrestrial Energy, backed by ARPAE, the Department of Energy Research Arm, and many others. And they're excited about those startups. The startups are using fourth generation technology like molten salt reactors. They're focusing on recycling nuclear fuel, using it as energy. They're focusing on small modular reactors, some advanced modular reactors, mostly SMRs. So that's what they're focused on. But more importantly, in the eyes of ESG investors, they talk up their environmental benefit. And they promote themselves as the new green and safe nuclear. And so that's what's happening. They're positioning themselves that way and the ESG investors are increasingly willing to invest into them. And so this is a very underappreciated risk for nuclear. A huge risk, but a very underappreciated one this maturing of nuclear startups. Now, why do you think people like Bill Gates, these super billionaires, are investing hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions into nuclear? Because they see an opportunity for major disruption. Remember, Bill Gates ran Microsoft when it disrupted the huge giant, the blue giant of IBM, and became the much larger company. He knows the playbook of disruption. He knows what it takes. And so these startups want to create and dominate a new category of green nuclear. That's what they're after, a new category. And for those of you who don't know about these categories, that's startup disruption business strategy 101. Create a new, step one, create a new category. Step two, dominate it. Step three, profit. And that's what they're after. Now, Tesla is a great example of what happened with nuclear startups. So think about Tesla. Right now, it's a huge company. It's worth over $650 billion. That's much larger than the companies that are here, let's be honest. 
it started, you know, it came out of nowhere pretty much several years ago. You know, who heard of Tesla before 2015, right? But it was founded 20 years ago, and it started to take charge of this category of green car, all electric car, green car. It defined this category, and big auto wasn't paying attention. You know, Ford, GM, Chrysler, they were like, eh, whatever, who cares? <laughs> Small category, nobody will buy it. And so they let Tesla you know, play with that green car category. And right now, Tesla dominates the green car category. You know what its market share is in the United States? 2%. Tesla is 2% market share. You know what the market share is for Ford, GM, and Chrysler? It's over 40%. So. Well, guess how much Ford, GM, and Chrysler are worth? Hmm? Not under that, but they are worth under 200 billion. 40% market share, under 200 billion. 2% market share, over 650 billion. Tesla can buy all of them easily three times over. <laughs> Who will be the Ford of nuclear, and who will be the Tesla? Think about that. These startups, again, run by Bill Gates, they know what they're doing, they know the playbook of disruption. They're quoted very often in the media about how new green nuclear is safe. This is the safe nuclear, this is the clean nuclear, implicitly and sometimes explicitly positioning traditional nuclear as not. Now, think about it. What if Gates and others convince the public that only green nuclear is clean and safe? How much will that cost you? You can't let Gates and others like him win the narrative war. You need to convince Americans that traditional nuclear is the true green and clean nuclear, which it is. <laughs> now, as part of doing so, you need to shift your strategy, it's not only your narrative, it's also your strategy that you need to shift. You need to be consistent in your strategy and your narrative, not to be accused of greenwashing and hypocrisy like Exxon was, with unfortunate consequences for Exxon. Now, what does that mean? There are three parts to the strategic pivot that will align you with this new narrative. One is something that you're already doing, protecting existing nuclear plants and ones under construction like Bogle. This is something that you must do. You must fight for licensed plant extension. The current nuclear plants can function for many, many years with uh, upgraded equipment, and I strongly encourage you to not focus on upgrading equipment on traditional equipment like gas turbines, but orient more toward advanced technology for upgrading nuclear plants. Technology of the future will get to why, but that will be a point that I want you to be thinking about. You also want to work with governments, state governments, federal government, local governments, to keep nuclear plants open. Exelon and others have been doing this for many decades. So you want to work on this, you want to focus on this, and you want to deal with the unfair market conditions that are causing a lot of problems for nuclear. You want to reduce the unnecessary regulatory burden. We already talked about how to do that. It's a narrative. You want subsidies for all clean energy. We already talked about how to do that. It's a narrative carbon tax and fossil fuels to make a fair market condition for clean energy, and the clean energy standard, which are two related things. Now, a great thing for nuclear right now is that what the Democrats are trying to pass, the 3.5 trillion gargantuan <laughs> infra, you know, infrastructure project, might have clean energy as part of it. And this is a great opportunity to persuade the public, shift the narrative by running some advertisements in the districts of the key lawmakers on this clean energy standard and other sorts of advocacy. So that's strategy one. Your long-term future, that's your short-term future. Your long-term future is with small modular reactors, advanced modular reactors, small modular reactors, third plus and especially fourth generation technology. That's where your long-term future is. So that's what you wanna be thinking about as your long-term future, as part of shifting the narrative. Why is that beneficial? Well, they minimize nuclear waste by recycling previously used fuel, a number of them. And that's what you want to focus on, that subcategory 
that minimizes nuclear waste because that will align with your narrative of being the green, clean nuclear future. You also want to focus on lowering costs. I mean, a big, big issue in nuclear, as we all know, is cost overruns. Much less cost overruns for modular reactors because modular reactors are built in the factory. Much less worries about on-site cost overruns. And Gates and others are using this, minimizing nuclear waste, much less cost overruns, and so on, as huge selling points for SMRs. Now, you want to make sure that you pursue the same strategies aggressively so that you can make the same claims authentically. But being honest, SMRs will not be commercially deployable large scale for, until the next decade. So your existing plans are your reality, your reality right now. And SMRs are your future. You want to treat your existing plans like what they are. Protect them. They're your cash cows for the future. And you want to milk maximum value from them. Two, first of all, shift the narrative. Second of all, of course, develop SMRs. And third of all, invest into nuclear startups. So I'm shocked by how few nuclear companies are doing so. Investing into startups, this is a great strategy. This is wonderful. You get to learn from their experience by getting an inside look once you invest into them significantly and get on their boards. You'll learn about their effective communication, their new technology. You'll learn about ones that are good to form partnerships with, which of course you, you can do to help yourself build good technology and shift the narrative. And you can learn about the best targets to acquire to prevent them from dominating the green nuclear category and facilitate yourself doing so. Now, I worked with a big pharma company as a strategic consultant on some of these techniques, and we looked at the techniques that big tech, big technology, use quite successfully, consistently, to deal with the threat of new startups. And you probably heard about some of these techniques. And these are all classic techniques, learn, partnership, and acquire. And the big pharma company was quite successful at adapting these techniques to actually address the threat of biotech startups. So that's my personal experience, but you probably also saw, for example, in the big beer industry, how much of these small craft breweries are owned by big beer companies? Similar strategies. Now, if big pharma and big beer can do it, so can big nuclear, <laughs> if you avoid the complacency of big auto. Your future is strong and bright if you avoid that complacency and seize your destiny. Nuclear should be positioned as the big brother of solar and wind to grow into the biggest source of electricity in America. Now, you might have trouble believing this is possible <laughs> from 20%, but it's definitely possible. I mean, if France can do it, so can we. You just need to adopt the best practices in nuclear psychology to do so and shift the narrative. And this book shows you how to do so. So I'll be doing a book signing at 12 o'clock over lunch, so 12 to 1.30, you can come later. This book talks about these cognitive biases, these behavioral science strategies that you can use to shift, to seize control of the narrative and pivot your strategy effectively. So that's what the book is about. Each of you should have, each of you should have a virtual copy, including the ones who are attending virtually, the ones who are attending physically, you should all have a physical copy in your case, in the bag that you got. What gives me hope for nuclear? A lot of hope is seeing smart money like Bill Gates getting into nuclear. Why are they getting into nuclear? Because they see an opportunity. They see an opportunity for major profits, major fame, and major glory. They want to seize it for themselves. It's natural. You can't let them do that. You need to take charge. Seize control of the narrative. Learn to speak the language of environmentalism. Focus on protecting public health. Reframe nuclear safety as protecting public health from the dangerous effects of fossil fuels. And you want to, of course, deal with ESG investors by managing your narrative and pivoting your strategy to be authentic. Pivoting your strategy, we talked about what that involves. Three parts. 
protect existing plants, invest into SMRs, and acquire, partner, learn from startups. Now, I was talking to a top nuclear executive, and he told me that nuclear is like a huge cruise ship that's trying to turn to avoid the iceberg of the nuclear twilight, which is an obvious pain point that you know, a lot of you folks at this conference are worried about. But unfortunately, the efforts to turn the cruise ship, he told me, are on cruise control. <laughs> and you want to avoid this complacency of cruise control. That is not the future you want. So take heed of the warnings of the threats I highlighted. Implement the solutions, the suggestions that I propose if you want to avoid the iceberg of the nuclear twilight. Instead, you want to seize the wheel and go full steam ahead toward a true green nuclear future by seizing control of the narrative, using best practices from nuclear psychology, and pivoting your strategy accordingly, you will become agile and innovative for a truly strong nuclear future. Now go out there and seize your destiny. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Dr. Gene Nelson, Californians for Green Nuclear Power. And I've been watching what's going on in Pennsylvania, where the American Petroleum Institute has been very quietly funding a very aggressive anti-nuclear power campaign mm -hmm. to the tune of over $26 million, uh, at least it was uh, reported by Alternative Press. Yeah. What can we do about the franchise protection uh, efforts that are very well funded by fossil fuel interests. Thank you, I appreciate that question. And that actually relates to what was happening with Indian Point nuclear plant, of course, because some of the f natural gas interests also lobbied and funded against for the closing of the Indian Point nuclear plant quite successfully. So, I mean, the answer to that is nuclear has much more money than 26 million. <laughs> Let's be honest. You just need to direct it effectively. Right now, it's not being directed effectively. It's not being directed where it's needed. It needs to be directed at shifting the narrative. That is the first and primary target of your public advocacy. You also need to be advocates. All of you need to be advocates with your efforts. That will, <laughs> that will get you much, much more PR <laughs> than 26 million. You need to convince the public and the public will be convinced, whether in Pennsylvania, whether in New York, and elsewhere, we saw successful examples. And the book talks about the strategies to help you reframe the narrative. But that's what you gotta do. You gotta direct your money, you gotta direct your time. This is the only way, this is a war, and you need to realize it. You know, obviously, oil is going to go against nuclear. Obviously, gas is going to go against nuclear. Obviously, coal is going to go against nuclear. They want to undermine nuclear, of course they do. They're also going after wind and uh, energy and solar, you know, and uh, wind and solar and hydro, and nuclear is only part of their targets. Unfortunately for nuclear, you are the most vulnerable because you do not have good m m image management of the narrative, and people perceive you as scary, and that's terrible for nuclear. And we have countries that have done a much better job from which we can learn <laughs> from what to do a better job and what you can do to be effective advocates. Stephen Arndt, um, quick comment and then a question. Um, first of all, I very much agree with you associated with the uh, regulatory concept and I, I've, I've written on how we should really look at our safety goal both in terms of absolute sense and in relative sense mm -hmm. to the alternative way of generating an a, uh, advantage, in this case, energy. My question is, and I think that's a very good narrative for us, but my question is with respect to seizing the narrative associated with um, not comparison with fossil fuel, but comparison with uh, wind and solar and hydro, mm -hmm. I think we've had challenges 
comparing ourselves or contrasting ourselves or, or associating ourselves with the other green energies. Can you comment on good, good strategies when talking to the public associated with that kind of narrative? Yeah, so let's talk about that. So I was going to, it's gonna be, take too long to flip for the PowerPoint, but basically the, the first chart I showed about the US information agency and the energy information agency shows that your main competitor is gas. It's not, it's not wind, it's not energy, it's not uh, solar, it's not hydro. Your main competitor is gas. That's who is really targeting the most for new, gunning the most for nuclear. So just you know, want, want everyone to be aware of that. It is fossil fuels are your main competitor. Now, when you're specifically competing for clean energy money against wind, against solar, against hydro, what is a very good narrative and something that a lot of environmentalists support is biodiversity. When you look at the research on biodiversity, and you can see very clearly that wind and solar, so we're talk, let's talk about these because they're kind of top, uh, obviously, it's obvious for hydro, lakes, and so on. Wind and solar are big, big, big contributors to losses of biodiversity because the kind of rare earth metals that they are needed for wind and solar are mined in huge quantities in strip mines. So you need much more mining for wind and solar than you need for nuclear. That's one. Second, the kind of place they take. You know how many birds are killed by turbines? You know how much space is occupied by solar panels? How many birds are killed by nuclear plants? How much space is occupied by nuclear plants you know, per kilowatt hour? It, it, it's, it's not a comparison. So biodiversity will be your best narrative when you're specifically competing in those narrower situations with wind, solar, hydro. But your main competitor is gas. This coal is already going down. It's still a competitor. Depends on which part of the country. Okay. And then over here. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to pick up on what you just said. And uh, uh, when you talk about, uh, first of all, I appreciate your comments, and uh, I think they're they're uh, very disruptive, which I think is good. Uh, when you talk about nuclear companies, one of the challenges that we face is that a lot of our big, well-heeled nuclear companies aren't really nuclear companies. Mm -hmm. yep. they're, they're energy companies. Yep. And they generate electricity with a variety of means and they're, they're, they're reluctant to uh, uh, to undercut one for the other. Actually, they're less reluctant to undercut nuclear than they are the other means I, yeah. I've, I've discovered. So, so just as a, 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 my, my observation and the, the company that, that serves my, uh, my home is very, very green. It's well over 50% emissions free, mm. and that's all nuclear. And what you see them advertise all day long uh, is uh, their solar program mm -hmm. and how you yeah. can pay more money in your electric bill so you can generate solar electricity. So, so that's, I guess, my, my question yeah. to you is, given that uh, uh, conflict of interest, if you will, how does the nuclear industry, such as it is, uh, follow the prescription that you laid out there with your three strategy points? Well, thank you, Steve. That's a really important question, and I appreciate you raising that up. Obvious conflict within the many nuclear co companies that are subdivisions of larger energy companies. What you really want to do is target lower hanging fruit first. Because the reason that those companies are not supporting nuclear as much, a lot of it has to do with the lack of support for nuclear and public narrative. Why would they support nuclear and have advertising for nuclear if they know that people wouldn't resonate with it? So there are plenty of lower hanging fruit that you can, that you can pick first. Lower hanging fruit like community plan tours, like people becoming, all people, nuclear engineers and managers becoming active advocates. And then situationally, you can focus on safety from nuclear against the fossil fuels. And this is a realistic issue, a serious issue that needs to be addressed. It's not always going to be politically viable within a company to address it. But there are plenty of other things that you can do that are lower hanging fruit. So if you are in that situation, which many folks here are, I would recommend looking at my specific advice 
on lower hanging fruit that you can definitely do in any sort of context that will not be a question within any company. Hi, thank you. Marilyn Cray from Exelon. Um, regarding the ESG communications to investors and other stakeholders, most of those are targeting metrics around reducing carbon footprint or emissions. Mm -hmm. Do you have any views on companies that are already nuclear and renewable, so don't have that headroom to reduce, but how to frame that to talk about perhaps the legacy of that, but, but again, promote that without having the ability to talk about the reductions because, because essentially you're already green. Yeah, so you're already green. I, what I've seen nuclear companies that are fully nuclear, fully green, is not talk up their green standards nearly enough. They don't talk about how, they're not simply green, but how they're proud of it, and how this is something that was, they're creating the future. Because right now, so many companies, nuclear companies, are perceived as part of the past. And this is not a narrative that you want in people's heads. And this is not a narrative that you know, ESG investors are very future oriented. You want to present yourself as part of the clean, green future. And that's really key. And then another part of the key is what kind of technology are you using? Are you orienting toward fourth generation technology? Minimizing nuclear waste? Can you talk about that to these ESG investors, talk to them that your plans, sure, right now, you're orienting toward what you have right now. Of course, you should protect what you have. Don't need more investments. But your future investments, if you change your strategy, honestly and authentically, and say, our future strategy is to invest into SMRs, and as part of that, we will invest into SMRs that are minimizing nuclear waste, existing nuclear waste, by recycling it, which a number of SMRs can do. And we're also creating, I mean, a number of SMRs that have a lot of safety, which is beneficial, definitely. A number of SMRs do things, I mean, all SMRs are modular, so they reduce costs, and of course, any investor cares about that. So I would say, talk about that combination, about your pride in environmentalism, is that's really important, that's what the ESG investors wanna hear, and about your future investments into SMRs, specifically those that minimize nuclear waste. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes, hello. The, to your left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, hello. Uh, enjoyed your discussion. And um, we, we talk about minimizing waste, but however, as you well know, the, the, the critical piece or the Achilles heel is, is the permanent repository. What do you do with waste? So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your strategy sure. on how would you answer that. Yeah, I love the way that the French did it. So here's what happened with the French. The French had, uh, Obviously, some nuclear plants already from the 70s. In the late 80s, it got to be a serious issue, nuclear waste. There's controversy about it. As in the United States, there was the idea that, hey, we should find a place and we should bury it. You know, natural for technical thinkers to have that approach. And so the French, the nuclear industry, tried to do that. They went, you know, people were pretty supportive, are still pretty supportive of nuclear. They went to the countryside, started digging holes, exploring, and they got massive protests from the local French citizens. And they were not sure why, because nuclear was popular. <laughs> but these people were protesting. And so this became a really heated issue. And the French nuclear industry couldn't deal with it, so they gave it to the French politicians. And the French politicians, they, the parliament, appointed a pretty savvy politicians who actually went and talked to people and looked and had an investigations of what's going on. Why were people upset? Why were people concerned? And the reason they were concerned is because they perceived the government as coming in and bringing this waste from elite Parisians and burying it in their rural region and leaving it forever. Kind of decimated, polluted, you know, a nuclear waste dump, literally. And so they were unhappy with that idea. And so this politician proposed a solution. Instead of having a nuclear waste dump, what they would do is build a laboratory that would investigate how to transmute long-term waste into short-term waste from tens of thousands of years into a few centuries, which is something that current advanced modular reactors look like they're going to be able to do. So they proposed, he proposed building a lab, and as part of that lab, 
making all waste reversible. Stockability, not a dump, permanent dump, but a stock center for nuclear waste. And he got so much opposition from the nuclear industry. I mean, I see a number of you being kind of you know, su surprised, <laughs> let's say that one, and, and uh, you know, having skeptical expressions on your faces, which is natural for technical thinkers. I mean, how can you not bury nuclear waste? It's gonna be so freaking expensive to make it stockable <laughs> rather than just bury it permanently. Well, this politician won the argument, and you know what? A number of regions started to bid for the lab to be built there, and people, protests dissipated. They were happy to have good lab jobs come to the region. They were happy to be the center that would solve the French problem of nuclear waste by transmuting it <laughs> instead of just you know, being the nuclear waste dump. So they built their, the, that was something that was very effective for addressing protests and concerns about nuclear waste. So that is definitely something that is a strategy that can be implemented in the United States. It would have to be, obviously, the federal government would have to be involved in it, it would have to be a whole process, but it's definitely doable. We see from the example of France that they have a brilliant psychological approach to it. Because it's all about psychology, it's all about what these citizens are thinking, and the protests dissipated because of this. So that's what I would suggest. Hello, hi. Okay. Jessica Harper here in the back with Excel and Power Labs. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I was particularly interested in your comment pertaining to entrepreneurship and oh. startups in the nuclear realm. Um, as a business person who sees a lot of opportunity uh, for innovation in the nuclear industry, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how best startups could access capital, um, overcome the high regulatory um, burden and um, barriers to entry for a nuclear startup. Mm -hmm. Do you envision that coming from corporate startups or have you seen other countries um, foster a culture that's more conducive to nuclear startups? And if so, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what that looked like. Thank you. Sure. There are no effective other countries that foster nuclear startups that have a system like the United States. You have nuclear startups in Russia and in China that are corporate and funded by the government and doing quite well. So they have a lot of innovation, but that's all funded by the government that will not work in the United States. What I suggest you strongly think about in the United States is investments from all the fine folks sitting here. <laughs> we talked about partnerships. Now, when you look at where innovative ideas come from, and there's a lot of research on innovation, and that's, I talk about some of that in the book, you overwhelmingly don't see innovation coming from inside traditional companies. There's the way that innovation comes from inside traditional companies is set up to be incremental rather than, rather than out of the box because innovation involves many, many, many failures. <laughs> and that's not something that traditional companies facilitate and reward. So innovation comes really from outside, what existing big nuclear can do is find effective startups and invest into them, which as I mentioned, that's how big tech was able to deal with startups, that's how big pharma was able to deal with startups, you know, big beer, other companies, other industries, not big auto, they really screwed up. <laughs> so as you're thinking about startups, though, you know, I mentioned that big tech and big pharma were able to address this threat. But the way they addressed this threat was very beneficial for startup founders. Because startup founders who started a startup and got some investment from the outside and were lucky and skilled enough to have innovative ideas that panned out got very high rewards, monetary rewards. And it was a win-win situation for the companies, whether big tech or big pharma, that acquired these startups because they got innovative ideas for which they had to pay much, much less than they would if they tried to make them from inside the company. So this is a win-win proposition. And that's what I would suggest that you, pro that you pursue. Again, you know, if folks here, at least some of them, buy, this, buy my suggestion, then you have a lot of potential funders with whom you can collaborate. 